We have a fabulous treat for you. Look around and get a proud sense of the media family sitting all around you. This is our movie industry career vision guest session of the 14th annual North American All Youth Film and Education Day. I'm Megan Klassen, I'm 17 and I attend El Camino High School. I love movie making and I earned a place in our film day with my entry documentary, The Last Battle. I've also begun to apply to the best California film schools and it's exhilarating. And I'm James Papilla. I'm 17 and I'm a film and broadcast journalism student at Christian Brothers High School. This is going to be my life. I know it. Megan and I hope this communication arts field will be your choice as well. It's so exciting to introduce you to today's industry wizard. His name is Tom Shadyak. Tom is a wonder. A writer, director, producer, stand-up comedian, and actor. But the reason he's here goes beyond all of that. Born in Virginia, Tom came to LA at the age of 24 to work as a comedy writer for Bob Hope. Then, he got ma his master's degree in film from UCLA in 1989, alongside critical acclaim for his first movie, Tom, Dick, and Harry. A string of incredible, original, zany, and inspiring movies followed. Ace Ventura, Patch Adams, The Nutty Professor, Bruce Almighty, and Evan Almighty, to name just a few. His television production work was also huge, but he did not want us to talk about his past, but about something profound that changed his whole life focus. Tom had a really bad bike accident and a head injury that almost killed him. The jolt changed his view of his own life and the world around him. It sounds cliche, but when it happens to you, it's not a movie. Before he felt he might die, he was gripped by two questions. What's wrong with the world and what can we do about it? His work? became a mission. Figuring out how to do something worth dying for, he sought out the most influential, philosophical, and socially active men and women in the world. People who are the greatest examples of teaching and communicating human kindness. He was looking for integrity and for kindred spirits. He saw his Hollywood lifestyle, big mansion, unexamined relationships, fame and fortune as a total distraction and meaningless compared to genuine, bold, caring and giving with others. His newest movie, I Am was born. A documentary of the most insightful world thinkers and chain agent, change agents testifying about real life and death challenges to which they decided to devote their lives. These people became Tom Shadyak's mentors, his role models. Please let us introduce you to a filmmaker who humbly and urgently wants to live as a real teacher through his art. We hope that this next 90 minutes may change your lives if you listen carefully and accept his invitation to have a real dialogue to, after he introduces himself to you. Here's the real thing, Mr. Tom Shadyak, our Tower of Youth wizard. Hi, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I went out and talked to people about two questions because they were questions that were on my mind after I got sick. I almost died. Uh, I had a, or at least I thought I was going to die. I had a very serious bike accident where I got a concussion and it developed into a, a syndrome called post-concussion syndrome. And what that is is the concussion symptoms don't go away. And if you've ever, how many of you have had a concussion? It's a pretty tort you have. You're so football players, skateboarders, we've had these concussions and you, you get, it's tough. The symptoms are tough, and when they don't go away, it feels kind of torturous. So many people who have post-concussion syndrome are so tortured, they actually commit suicide, and it's a pretty sad thing. Um, but I had no way out, and I thought I was not going to make it. So 
for my last chapter of my life, I thought, if I'm going to die, what do I want to talk about before I go? And the film I Am was born. So I asked two questions. I gathered people who were uh, sort of the top thinkers at their professions, uh, religious folks, uh, uh, academics, uh, uh, people in social media, and I asked them two questions. What's wrong with our world, and what can we do about it? Now, what's wrong with our world? I don't want to hear the usual answers. Ah, oh, man, there's an economic crisis. There's poor in the world. Ah, oh, the environment. I wanted to get beneath the things that I consider to be symptoms. So that's what we're going to talk about today, because I believe you guys are in a culture that is depressing your authenticity, your creativity, it's pitting you against each other, and it's up to you guys to birth a new culture. So, yes, it is your world, folks. It is your world coming. So, let me show you this first clip, just to show you how I was in the land of the unknown. Have you ever seen any of my movies? Just kidding. I don't know which ones. <laughs> Sorry. Did you ever see Ace Ventura? Ace Ventura. Ace Ventura. Did you ever hear of that movie? It's a Jim Carrey movie. God bless him. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've ever what? even heard of it. Ace Ventura. No. You ever heard of Ace Ventura? What? Mm -hmm. Come on, brother. Say it again. Have you seen any films that I've done, just curiously? What? Ace Ventura is one of my pe children and our family's favorite movie. <laughs> I should, I should take a look at it. <laughs> but that was the world that I was in. I was in a world where they had no idea what I did. I had very little cachet in this world at all. And thank God I ran into Lynn, who actually uh, uh, saw Ace Ventura. Um, but there's a principle behind that, folks. Uh, so much of our society wants to create safety. But a man named Rene Descartes, who you've probably heard of, said, if a human being wants to grow, they have to learn to question everything. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to start to learn to question what we, what you, what all of us have been taught, and we're going to break it down. So the, um, Megan said earlier um, that uh, I had achieved a certain amount of success, and it's the success that you all are told um, uh, will lead to what we call the American dream and the good life. And I had a very interesting experience after I achieved that quote-unquote good life. So let's take a look at the second clip Please. I think one of the fundamental messages in the American marketing machine is that wealth and happiness are synonyms. If you want happiness, you have to have wealth and you have to buy stuff, you know, own lots of stuff. There ain't no reason things are this way. It's how they always been and they intend to stay. I can't explain why we live this way. We do it every day. People walk around pushing back their debts. Wearing paychecks like necklaces and bracelets Talking about nothing, not thinking about death Every little heartbeat, every little breath But love will come set me free Now I didn't always have stuff or the money to buy stuff. When I started out, I struggled like most artists. But I finally got a directing break when I took a chance on a guy who at the time was known as the white guy on In Living Color. My world changed overnight. And well, I kind of went shopping. First, I bought a little 7,000 square foot house in the hills of Beverly. Swimming pools, movie stars. Your choice for favorite comedy motion picture is the Nutty Professor, Liar Liar. Bruce Almighty. And when more film success came my way, I bought a bigger house and more stuff. I was flying privately everywhere, vacationing, looking for properties. But something odd happened to me when I moved into my first Beverly Hills house that kind of took the edge off my buzz. I was standing alone in the entrance foyer after the movers had just left, and I was struck with one very clear, very strange feeling. I was no happier. There I was, standing in the house that my culture had taught me was a measure of the good life, and it made me absolutely no happier. Hmm. But guys, that shocked me. Um, I, 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 it was a very real experience to me. I had been trained, and you're trained every day by the media, which is what this whole conference is about, the media, which you must shift. 
The media told me every day, and it's telling you every day what it is to be successful. So you've got MTV Cribs, you've got billionaires in front of your face, you have these, these extrinsic, external goals that will say, oh, Tom Shadiak has arrived. He has the right house, the right car, he flies privately. And when I got there, it was empty. And I know that may make you go, yeah, 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 well, give me the mansion. For me, the experience was empty. Here's what made me happier, being able to uh, uh, express my art, being able to have a movie idea respected by a studio and supported, that made me happy, that was cool. I could put art into the world, ideas into the world, that, that paid off. But the stuff didn't pay off. They're now studying it in a field called positive psychology. We have all this research about what truly makes a person happy. Do you know where America is number 25 on the list of happiest countries in the world? We have a shit fit when we're not number one at the Olympics, but we're 25 in, in, in the scale of the thing that is most important. What makes a culture happy? So there are things we have to rethink. And you guys get to rethink them and rebirth them. I was told my whole life this story, that we are competitive and aggressive in our nature. That's what I was told, so we craft our society based on the fact that we all must compete with each other. That's what you're doing in school. I don't love this school model, to be honest. It's a, it's, a, it's a model that pits Mike against Mark. And there's only so many A's, and maybe if Mark gets one, Mike doesn't. And I think that is uh, a very inefficient model for bringing out the light and the creativity in all of us. I'm gonna give you one stat that shocks me. One stat, 90% of, of, of people aged two to three measure 90% measure high creativity at the ages of two to three. That drops by the time you're seven to 10 to 10%. So you go from 90% of the population being highly creative at the age of two to three to 10% at the age of seven to 10. And then when you get to be your age, less than 2% of you register as highly creative because we have suppressed the creativity out of you. So I essentially wanted to know if the story was true that I'd been told. Are we really competitive and aggressive in our nature? Do we always have to structure our society around competitive and aggressiveness, or is there another story that's true about human nature? So I asked the question, what is human nature? Who are we, and what is the nature of reality? And this, this will be the longest clip. This is about three minutes. I had never heard before, and it was cool. Now, the story that we've all been telling ourselves since Darwin was that you got an alpha animal that's in charge, and everybody else bows down, and that justifies kingdom and hierarchy, and that's why we should treat our president like a king, because that's just the natural order of things, isn't it? There were a couple of scientists that decided to test this hypothesis. There was this herd of red deer, and they said, you know, let's watch the deer. So they put these video cameras in the trees, and they're watching the herd. And at some point in time, they've got to go to one of the watering holes. Now, this is not a small decision. If they go too soon, then some of the members won't get enough nutrients. If they go too late, then some of the members may be dehydrated. If they go at the wrong speed, some of the members may not keep up and be vulnerable to predators. And it's a cultural problem for the deer. When do they go to the watering hole? Which of the watering holes do they choose? And who makes the decision? And what they expected was that the wise elder alpha deer who every spring butted heads with all the other deer, that, that he would say, okay, guys, time to go. You know, I've decided. But that's not what they saw happen. So what they saw happen was that as the deer were grazing, that some of them would start pointing at one of the three holes. And when the 51st percentage, say there was 100 deer, when the 51st deer pointed its head at one of the watering holes, so that a majority of them were pointing at one of the watering holes, within just a matter of moments, the entire herd would form together and go to that water hole. And very often, the alpha deer would be in the back going, where'd everybody go? And so they thought, well, this is really strange. I mean, you know, and it, over and over, day after day, the exact same thing. It was democracy. It, they were voting. What they found was that democracy was being played out literally every day by these animals. You know, I remember the first time I went scuba diving, and I'm seeing a school of fish going along, and all of a sudden they go like this. I just sit out in the backyard and watch a flock of starlings go by, and they're going like this, and then all of a sudden they're going like this, and then they're going like this. And, how do they know? Well, it turns out when you do the slow motion photography, they're all voting literally with every wing beat or with every gill beat. They're voting hundreds of times a minute.
and he said, you know, we found this from insects all the way up to primates. The basis of nature is cooperation and democracy. It's in our DNA. When Darwin wrote The Descent of Man, he mentioned survival of the fittest twice, and he mentioned the word love 95 times. He talked a lot about behaviors like conciliation, cooperation. He found in mammals all of the lineaments, as he put it, for the golden rule for the great religious ideals. The world is both cooperative and competitive. The world is both cooperative and competitive. Darwin mentioned the word love 95 times in The Descent of Man. He mentioned survival of the fittest twice. I went through 50 years of my life on Earth before I heard that. That's insane. And I believe it comes from a culture that is humming on an insane philosophy. Got to keep everybody separate. We got to compete against each other. We got to, you know, whoever gets the winner gets the toys and the spoils. That stuff is old. It's dying off. And again, you are going to put the death nail in that coffin. All of nature is a cooperative environment. We don't, we're not taught that. I thought nature was fierce, and it can be fierce. But the lion does not kill every gazelle. It kills just one gazelle. You can walk amongst the lions after they've been fed. A, a rainforest is a cooperative. The human body is a cooperative. Nothing in the human body takes more than it needs. If it does, we have a term for it. It's called cancer. And a cancer is something that just takes and grows without limit. And then it'll eventually kill the host and the body will die. And our economy is based on a cancerous philosophy. And you're entering that economy. And I hope we can do it differently by using a word and embodying a word called compassion into our economy. Our economy is based, and you hear it every day on television, did it grow today? Not, are people cool? Are they happier? Are they, you know, are they purposeful? Did the economy grow? You know, in Bhutan, they measure gross national happiness. They don't measure gross national product. We got to flip things. Um, you get to flip things. This is a fun little clip to show you again some of the biology of how you're wired to show how much you are in touch with the feelings and the emotions of another person. It's a discovery called the mirror neuron. We'll take a quick look. The great apes, along with dolphins and possibly elephants, uh, have something called a mirror neuron. And what was discovered was if a monkey observes a behavior that it itself has performed in the past, the same neuron lights up as if it itself is doing the action. In other words, there's something in the brain that doesn't distinguish between self and other. Very kind of mystical premise in some ways, but also underlies empathic behaviors. When you see somebody suffering, you feel it. That's the mirror neuron. so that we're really geared at a very primordial level to feel what another person feels. I like movies and quiet dinners. Oh my goodness. Oh, you, 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 you said it 15 times during that montage, the oh that you instinctively feel 
is called the mirror neuron. It is because you immediately, biologically, instantaneously empathize and feel the other person's pain. You see, so this idea of separation as you look at it is beginning to get broken down. It, it hurts, doesn't it, when you see the eye get cut, right? You feel something. That's part of the biology of who you are. This again, we went to a place called, a place called heart math. It's a, there's a new field of science called neurocardiology that is studying the human heart. I always thought it was about the brain, but the heart now is revealing tremendous things about who we really are. So take a look at this and we'll talk about it after you see. It's only a two minute clip about how the Heart Math Institute is starting to rediscover who we are. The medical paradigm of our last 30 years has been the body's there to carry the brain around and the brain's in control of everything. It's really not that way. 90 to 95 percent of the nerves are carrying information from the body to the brain, not the brain to the body. So in reality, the heart sends far more information to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. In a sense, uh, the heart is the boss of us. And they've discovered if you take readings of the interstitial beats of the heart, in other words, there's the heartbeat and then there's this seemingly blank space in between, a pause. It turns out that pause has a lot of information that can be monitored. And that pause, for example, can tell us what emotional state a person is in. You could think of the heart as a carrier wave. Well, as it turns out, the emotions are modulating the heart signal. And they found that positive states, particularly compassionate states, are healthy for you. These states actually renew our physiology. Love, care, gratitude, compassion, all of the things that we tend to associate and label positive, we do that for a reason, and that's the way it affects our body. Our heart is beating out a very different message. It's the optimal state. If the heart is sending a stressful or a negative emotional message or pattern, that literally inhibits our brain. We can't think clearly. You get mad at someone, they say something that you know, ticks you off, and then you, you say or do something that a minute later you go, oh my God, I can't believe I just said that. Where was my brain? It was inhibited. This is why anger makes us stupid. Whereas positive emotions lead to increased inner harmony, clear thinking, better performance, it's the mode we are literally designed to operate from. We function better in a state of empathy and compassion and love than we do in a state of separation. We function better in a state of empathy and compassion and love than we do in a state of separation or aggression. Now, if we, human beings, the human species, were competitive and aggressive by nature, why would that break down our physiology? Why would that literally make you sick? So we already know this, adults especially, if you're here, you know that the more stressed out you are, meaning the more you've been frustrated, angry, uh, aggressive, that we create a biology that induces uh, what's called stress-related diseases. You can give yourself a heart attack, you can give yourself early onset diabetes. So why, that's an important question. I just wanna know the truth. And it seems to me the truth is saying, I don't know if it was always like this with human beings, but somehow the human body may have evolved to a place where we have got to get along with each other to get through this. You know, Einstein said humanity is going to require a substantially new way of thinking if it's to survive. That's how we start this film with that quote. A new way of thinking that was the smartest almost inarguably the smartest man of the 20th century. So we gotta rethink things. Like you guys have all heard um, of these uh, studies, they were done you know, in the 60s and 70s, some of this alternative science, where if you, were, you had a plant, for example, and you talked to that plant, the plant would do better. And I thought, yeah, right, sure. Uh, what does a plant have to do with me? What does my mood have to do with a the plant? They've been studying this for a while now. And they put me through this, this, uh, this experiment called the yogurt experiment. And the theory is, you'll hear it in the clip, that human emotionality, the way you are right now, the way you feel, actually affects the living systems that are around you. So the living system is a person that's sitting next to you. And in this case, it's yogurt. So yogurt has a certain baseline bacterial living organism. Uh, it will read on a magnetometer, and they baseline that at zero, and then watch 
as they ask me some emotional things, what happens to the yogurt? It's pretty freaking freaky. Whoa! I'm going to put these two electrodes in the yogurt. Just get across it like so. Cover it up. Now we'll turn the meter on. HeartMath theorizes that human emotionality affects living systems. And while scientific protocols have been relaxed to allow for filming, according to Roland, my emotional state can impact the yogurt bacteria sitting in front of me. The trick is to really do something to get that unexpected, That's spontaneous kind of... Uh, okay. Maybe I should call my agent. Maybe that would do it. That's, that yeah, would do it. Yeah. Look, yeah, we actually are getting a bit of a response there, aren't we? As soon as I said the, my agent. Yeah. It's a source of uh, stress and trouble. Right, so... Yeah, look at that. That's because I'm literally thinking about that hand, that severed hand. And, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Just pinned it all the way to the end. Oh my god, that's pretty wild. <laughs> are, are you married? Nice question. <laughs> no, I'm not married anymore, Roland. <laughs> um, I could call my lawyer. I haven't talked to him in a very, very long time. Oh, God. <laughs> That's all. You don't need to we call We have him. a lot of stuff between us, literally. Oh, well, you just got the response. You don't need to call him. You don't need to call him. Now, obviously, I'm not connected to the yogurt. Obviously not, yes. So, but I'm connected to the yogurt. How? That's something we don't know. How? But based on these and many other types of experiments, is, is that human emotionality does create a very real energetic field that radiates out from us and that other living systems are attuned to those energetic fields. I don't think it's about having interaction with yogurt, but they're, again, scientific protocols, I'm not saying this is science, they've studied this and they need to study it much more, but there is something afoot here that there is a connection that I think we've been missing, and we've crafted again our society based on this separation philosophy. Let's pit each other, I take care of me first, you take care of you, and we really have nothing to do with each other. And science is saying, uh-uh. Science is saying what the mystics have said, everything is connected. It's what all the major faiths say at the core, everything is connected. And this idea of love as a force, you saw what heart math is finding. Your heart is beating and sending out an electromagnetic signal that is 10 to 15 feet from your body, and the emotions modulate that signal. So when you're in a loving state, and you stand next to somebody, and you say hello in a loving state, that has an effect. If you're in a negative state, which is breaking down your own physiology, that also has an effect. So it really speaks about the power of the individual. I know we look at the world and we go, oh my God, what can I do? You know, But you have much more power than you know, not just through media. Media is big, but who you are is bigger. It's the one exception I'll take with what Bob said. He said, the most powerful tool you have in your life is media. I say the most powerful tool you have is your life. You will never tell a more powerful story in any film than the one you will tell with your life. So my hope here is that we can have a conversation about who we are, because if we transform who we are, media transforms. Last a clip, Tiny Axe. I think this will speak for itself. It's short. Every word you utter to another human being has an effect, but you, you don't know it. If people began to understand that change comes about as a result of millions of tiny acts that seem totally insignificant, well then they wouldn't hesitate to take those tiny acts. You, you know the same there's only one way of eating an elephant, a piece at a time. And, and so, but you can't do anything about uh, global poverty, but yes, you can. You can do something about this guy. Because you see, remember, the sea is really only drops of water that have come together. You know this, if you don't do anything, and if everybody around you does nothing, things will stay. So a new story is beginning to emerge, and I can feel it. I teach college. I can feel it in the youth that I interact with. I could feel it here. So this new story, folks, is emerging, and it's what I want to talk to you about today. I went out and I asked the question, 
what's wrong with the world. And what I discovered was what was right with the world. And it gave me incredible hope that we can shift things. You know, when the Berlin Wall came down, nobody saw it coming. Just ideas had accumulated and mounted up behind that wall and created a pressure, an energetic pressure. And one day that wall fell. And now there's a wall in our culture dividing all of us. African American, Latino, white, Republican, Democrat, haves, have nots. It's a simple question. Are we brothers and sisters or not? So can I bring the two students up here and we can have a conversation about what we just saw? Um, come on up, guys. Can we have an all righty then for James and Megan? Okay, question. While people are queuing up, I would like to ask, how do you know that this kind of documentary will get anyone's attention, especially in our generation, because we're so fixated by being cool rather than taking risks and challenging norms? Right, how do I know that this will get any attention because your generation is so fixated on being cool and then challenging norms? I don't, but I followed my heart. And that's it for me. That's it. So, so it's, really, it's really not my job as to whether you guys respond or not. And that takes the pressure off. So you serve your heart and your art and you serve it with all that you are. And then the results are up to the universe, life, God, whatever you want to call it, the big electron, as George Carlin called it. But I have more faith in this generation. I think you guys know. I think you know that something ain't right and that we've tried and tried and tried a certain model and we can rethink it. Next question. All right, my name is Cody McDonald, and I'm from Bella Vista High School. Earlier, you had mentioned that you thought the school system's teachings were a little out of whack. Yes. So how would you change it to positively affect our up-and-coming youth, our, our real young kids, starting off from, you know, first grade okay. up to our high school level? How would you change it? Your name is Cody again, right? Us? Yes, sir. I would say my first question would be to young people, who are you? What do you love? I would just ask a young boy, what do you love? A young girl, what do you love? What do you feel drawn to? I like to draw. That's where I would start with education. What you love. Your heart is already very active and alive when you're young. That's why it says in the, in, in the scripture, for example, in the Christian side of things, where is the kingdom of heaven? It's within, right? So that young child, and, and, and unless you become like these little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven is what it says, in, again, in Christ, the Christian side of things. Other faiths believe in the uniqueness of children. But what we do with that children, with that child, is we plug them into a system and we say, here's what we have to teach you. And we should invert it and say, you tell me about you, and then our educational system will meet you there. So if you love to draw, I can teach you everything I need to teach you through, the, through the, your passion for drawing. I can teach you to be a writer because there are articles written about drawing and art. I can teach you math because there's business around art. And that's where we should meet kids at their own unique light and stop plugging you guys into a system that is turning you into us, into robots. And that's why you're looking out the window every day going, shit, I can't wait till frickin' school is over. You should be waiting. You should be looking out the window. You should be looking out the window. But I'll tell you this, I'm very encouraged, Cody. This system is only 100 or so years old, folks. Nobody who wrote the Constitution, nobody who wrote the Declaration of Independence and signed that was educated under this system. They were either mentored or homeschooled. So this has got to be opened up and rethought. Thank you. That's a beautiful question. Thank you. Thank you, brother. A big hand for Cody. Hi, my name is Tyler Flannery. I was wanting to ask, if, like, how do you think the world as a whole, do you think the education system dampens down our creativity if they don't want us to think outside the box, if they want us to conform to this little magazine of just random pictures and just things to buy, if it's more consumerism. Yes. Well, I think that's what they do, and they don't even realize they're doing it. I think our, even our parents do that without even realizing they're doing it. When you do something creative, like put crayon marks on the wall, they slap your hand and they say no. And all that is is a child expressing creatively free, why can't you paint on a wall? It's a beautiful canvas that's waiting to paint. That's an awesome thought. We, we squelch it, right? And I think education does that too because we're trying to teach you to do things the way we've done them. And, and that's not how you create things anew, you know? So, so you see it everywhere. 
You know, you see it everywhere. You see the way we dress and the way we, the way we reward. You'll see the reward system tonight when you go home and watch TV. Who's going to be on television tonight? But, but I, I, I don't believe it's because people are bad. I believe that they're just misinformed, you know? I think they, it's just ignorance. That's what Martin Luther King was brilliant at. He didn't look at the racist enemy as somebody he, he should hate. He looked at it as somebody that was broken and needed love. So the people that are behind our education system, the broken system, I think, need our understanding, but also our passion. This is what Matt Perry told me at lunch. He said the kids need that demand that they want media arts. They want to have a class on happiness. How about that? Just a class where we can talk about what makes a happy, meaningful, purpose-filled life. Wouldn't that be awesome? Where you could sit down and say, I'm, yeah, it would be amazing. So, but it comes from you, Tyler. You guys have to ask for it. So I hope, I hope you can start to deconstruct this. Again, I apologize if I didn't get specific enough, but thank you for your question. Give my hand, everybody. I just wanted to know, how, do you, how is it that it's only 10% that's using, you know how you said that there's only 10% that uses their imagination? I say measures high creativity, that consider high themselves creativity. highly creative. That's, it's, it's in self-identification. Well, why is it only 10% though? I wish I could tell you. I believe it's because our culture squashes and squelches creativity. I believe the way the study was done was they asked people, do you consider yourself a highly creative person? 90% of the kids raised their hand and said, yes, I'm highly creative because you're a kid. You're playful. Then by the time you get older and you're told, don't mark on that wall, you can't wear that, you can't scream, that's too emotional, you can't have that emotion, they ask the same question again. Are you highly creative? And only 10% said, yeah, I'm highly creative. But what about the people that don't want to show their creativity? You mean don't want to, that, basically that they're lying? Yeah. I know that at some point we have to take people at their word. You know, I don't know why other than... Again, even in the answer itself, the fact that somebody would hide that they were creative, they'd lie about it, that says exactly what we're saying. The fact that you'd be embarrassed to say I'm highly creative means that your culture's not embracing creativity. You know, otherwise you'd say yes, because a kid just says yes. But if you're gonna suppress it, you know, if you're, the culture's gonna say no, then you would be like, no, I'm not creative, I'm actually really serious. I, I, I wanna be a business person. I wanna be a lawyer, a doctor, you know? Okay, man. Yes. Um, and your name. Speak right into the mic. My name is Mia, and I go to Grant. Yes. I have two questions. My first question is, um, what do you say about the people who still have kept their creativity since they were a child? Who have kept their creativity since they were a child. What do I say about them? I say, thank God for you. Thank God for you. It means in spite of all the messaging your culture gave you, you hung on to this. I can't tell you guys how many times my loving parents, my society told me, you cannot be a director. You cannot make it in show business. You cannot be a writer. You can't be funny and make a living. That's not, what are you gonna do for a real job? You know, I was told that over and over and over, but fortunately, no other doors open for me in life. I was able to hang on to this, as I hope you folks can, who it's true to. And I, I, I bow down to you for that. <laughs> hang on to it, man. Okay. My second question is... Second question. Can I have a hug? Can you what? Can I have a hug? Can she, oh, can she have a hug? Oh my gosh, what a great question. Come on up. Beautiful, thank you. That was great, that was great. Can I have a hug? Holy smokes. Hey Tom. Yeah, up, Harold. Yeah, we're up here in the upper balcony because Lauren has a, uh, she's on crutches and she can't come all the way down. Okay, Harold, thank you. Lauren is gonna ask a question and we're gonna. Hi. Hi, Lauren. I'm Lauren. <laughs> I'm from Bella Vista. <laughs> so I was wondering like, how you got started and what age and what advice you would have for all of us in high school? Yes, um, how I got started, what age, and um, what advice for you guys in high school. I'm gonna give you a quote that is my advice, because I don't even think it's that important that I made it in show business. I think what's important is that um, I followed my heart. And there's a quote from the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, it's one of those suppressed gospels. Um, if you bring forth that which is within you, that which is within you will save you. 
if you do not bring forth that which is within you, that which is within you will destroy you. I'll say it one more time. If you bring forth that which is within you, that art, that creativity, that passion for justice, if you bring forth that which is within you, that will save you. If you don't bring it forth because you suppress it, oh, I, I could never go through school and be a lawyer and, and pursue my passion for justice. Oh, I could never be an artist in this society because it's not respected and well paid. If you don't bring that forth, that will destroy you. And that's why you see so many people that are my age and older whose light is dimming. And you, and, and you look at our, 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 our host and his light is increasing. You see? So um, my advice to you is follow your heart. And your heart, not your society's heart. Your society has put dollar signs by certain jobs. You may be here because you think it's cool to be an artist and it may not be in you. If that's true, look at that, examine that, and see what's true for you. If you are here because you want to be an artist, because story inspires you, film inspires you, you want to act, write, direct, produce, then follow it. Follow it. And there's many jobs in show business, people. Many jobs. The best advice that I got early was from um, Morgan Freeman uh, said when uh, John Avildsen was going to direct his first, or when Morgan was going to direct his first movie, John Avildsen gave him this advice. Morgan said, what should I do? What skills should a director have? And uh, John said, listen. And that's the advice I would give you, listen. Listen to yourselves, listen to your hearts, and listen to those around you, okay? So where can I... I love to, 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 to draw. I'm going to go out and uh, to L.A. or New York or in my own community and see where. I'm going to listen to see who needs me to get somebody a cup of coffee who I can apprentice under while they draw. The person who's producing for me now is named Dagan Handy. Dagan was my, quote, coffee getter about 10 years ago, and he had such a good attitude. That's the other thing I want to talk to you about is attitude. Attitude is everything. They, the culture teaches you image is everything. Attitude is everything. I'll give you an example. If you take a camera, okay, attitude is like the, the aperture of a camera. If you have a little bit of talent and your aperture is wide open, it all gets out. If you've got a crappy attitude and your aperture is closed and you're bitter and you're not a light when you walk in the room, that aperture closes down. You can have a ton of talent and very little gets out. So we need your apertures open. So... I know I'm giving you theory as opposed to make this call, you know. You guys, the information is all over now. It's on the web, it's all over. And make films. If you want to do what I do, you need to write, you need to make films, and you need to show those films, and you need to listen to the audience and see if you can improve your art. There you go. Okay, anyway, thank you, Lauren. Uh, hello, my name is Jerry Williams from Bear River High School. Yeah. Bear River High, right on. Uh, I just wanted to know the movie I Am. What, is it, what does it say to you? Like, what do you think about it? What do I think about it? Um, well, my whole goal with I Am was to start a conversation that I didn't see happening in this country. So, if you really want to know the truth, if I could um, speak bluntly and plainly and clearly, I think it's an incredibly, insanely, and this has nothing to do with me, but the idea that animates me, I think it's an incredibly important movie. You know, if a movie like An Inconvenient Truth took hold of our culture, and everyone said that won the Academy Award that year, that is an important movie because we're destroying the environment. I think this is as important or more so because this is why we're destroying the environment. This movie talks about our philosophy of separation, that man can do anything it wants. I'm not connected with nature. I can, it doesn't matter. I can take any number of trees. I can poison the river. I've got no connection. This movie talks about why we're doing these things. And that, look, the definition of intelligence has been said that it's the ability to identify primary causes. If we can identify the primary cause of why all this stuff is happening, we can shift it. So I think it's really friggin' important. Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate the question. Hey, I'm Mike from Bear River. Mike, what's up from Bear River? No one here from Bear River? <laughs> um, I'm wondering, you were talking about like what's inside our DNA, like love right. and compassion, but you weren't talking about like all the greed and all the other stuff that's like negative. Were you like trying to more focus on the positive and just forget about the negative? Well, first of all, this, the negative quote unquote story you have been told is all over, so and you see it every day on, you know, we're told, no, 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 mankind is a greedy species and et cetera, et cetera. So I wasn't interested in, 
in, in putting that story any further mm -hmm. out there, if you will. But see, I really don't believe that mankind is a greedy species. If mankind is a greedy species, it should be greedy for what's true, right? Mm -hmm. So I think I may be greedy, I'll, I'll grant you that, but I'm greedy for what's true. So if it was really true that wealth made me come alive, wealth in terms of the monetary stuff side, I would be preaching that gospel. Hmm. So I, I don't believe that we're just greedy. I think we can, we have a choice. I think we can, we have a choice, but I look at the biology. Look at this connection. Look at who we elevate in our cultures, various religions. Who are we always elevating, the greedy? No, we elevate Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Jesus, St. Francis, Mother Teresa. These are the people that we go, yes, that's so beautiful how they live their lives. I believe there's a reason we find beauty in it. We don't find as much beauty in the greed. We say greed, we say greed. We don't, uh, that person's greedy. Already in your instinctive response to that statement, I think says who you are. So yes, I didn't want like a movie about, now let's explore the negative. You turn on the television, you get it all day, every day. Thank you for your question. My name is Brittany and I'm from Grant High School. Um, I wanted to know like, no matter all the obstacles and downfalls like in your life, what keeps you motivated? All the obstacles and all the downfall in my life, what keeps me motivated? Um, I believe uh, in love. And I believe in this, Emerson said, there's a higher, a little consideration of what takes place around us every day, which shows us that a higher law than that of our will regulates events. In other words, there's something, there's some creative force that is, I believe, animating me. It makes the blood flow in my veins. It makes me so excited to talk to you. I believe in that force. And that force, whatever it is, I feel like I'm serving. And that's really what keeps me going. And every time I get down, that force laughs in my ear and goes, by the way, I'm not talking about God as our religions have invented God. I'm talking about just something that we all hear. And that, that, that voice says, it's all good, brother. Get up. Get up, man. And I do. And I do. And I hope you guys do. And it's that idea animates me. Does that make any sense? A little bit, maybe not. See, some people call that God, and I don't want to use the term God, which is a term we have agreed on culturally to talk about mystery, only because you might think of it in a religious sense, and I don't want any division here. But I believe there's something here that will play out this incredible experiment called life on this planet through me and you and art. So that's what animates me. I feel high talking about it. I'm getting the munchies right now. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm Brendan Page from uh, Christian Brothers High School. Brendan Page from Christian Brothers, right on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we have like three people here today. Um, <laughs> James. <laughs> uh, so my question is, I guess, like less Socratic and like deep and thoughtful than everybody else's. But uh, I was just wondering, with all those films that you've been doing and everything, um, are you? always happy with the way they turn out or looking back are you like is 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 every film always a, a success and you're like oh i did that better than you know i thought i would have and it's great or is there always something that you kind of look back and you kind of wish you had done differently i guess it's brennan right yes it is okay brennan um it's fun he asked that because it's so specific to me i think please forgive me for this but it's honest i think everything i've done by the time it ends sucks Truly, and I don't say that to, to sort of self-load. Um, and I'll tell you why I believe it's so, because I've lost perspective. So I've helped to write everything I've done. You know, I was credited on Ace and, and, and uh, Nutty Professor, but I wrote on everything I did. And um, I've written it, I've helped to cast it, I've rehearsed it with the actors, I've shot it, and I've edited it and seen it a million times. So it's like hearing the same joke over and over and over, and I think, oh my gosh, nobody in the world's gonna think this is funny, interesting, engaging. Every surprise in a movie has been revealed, I've seen it. So by the time it's done, I'm like, ah. When Ace Ventura came out, I'll tell you one quick story. When Ace Ventura came out, I finished cutting this movie and I thought, shh, this isn't funny. I mean, I'm not laughing anymore, my editor's not laughing anymore. We showed it to this studio, which was a group called Morgan Creek, and I showed it to some very buttoned down executives. 
They laughed one time in the movie. They thought it was the worst piece of Donkey Kong crap in the world. And they told me to cut the whole ending out of the movie and make the end of the movie the montage. You remember where Ace finds the ring with the missing stone? Make that the end because that was the one laugh. It was insane. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll, maybe I'll go to law school. I'll do something else because I, obviously I'm not talented as a director. My editor said, show it to people. People will tell you if there's anything in this movie. Show it to an audience. And so we took it out to a young audience and they went gaga for the thing. And I went, oh, I relived it through your eyes. And so I think an artist oftentimes loses perspective and can get very, very discouraged because we think, ah, it didn't come out the way I had hoped or it wasn't as funny as I had hoped. But that's when you want to share your piece of work with somebody and then listen again and feel. And I've felt so encouraged by the work we've done. I didn't have any idea what this movie was going to be, I am. But I felt so encouraged by the audiences. The first audience we showed it to at a film festival, we won the Audience Award and the Student Choice Award, and it became the talk of the festival. And that encouraged me again, well, maybe there's something here. So if you have doubt, I understand. You must, as a great young gentleman said up here, see your vision through. You don't want to have half birth things. Birth them and see, we'll see what that child looks like as you walk it in the world. Good question, Brendan. My name is Jonathan Boone. I'm from UC Irvine. And uh, I was actually planning how you plan to distribute this. Because you have a powerful piece, but how do you get people to see it? Well, you guys are essential to this. If there's anything in this you saw, you only saw part of it, we need you to tell your friends. If something you think interests you, not only go, but tell your friends, hey, let's go check this out. Let's go check this out, OK? So the part of the clips that you showed me that really, really got me was the whole cooperation with the animals, study, and the deer. And then, um, so I'm just wondering, like, with our society today, we are so set on looking a certain way, being the most good-looking, being the thinnest, being the coolest, and our society is so set on that, and even adults, you know, like with our teachers. And when you're at school, you know, you may think a certain way, like, oh, yeah, we need to be the change, but it doesn't happen. Like, so as a whole, as a society and culture, how do you think we would go about changing and being a culture of cooperation and not competition. Well, I have to ask you a question. Why doesn't it happen, Shelby? Because, like I said, I just feel like, you know, we all think that... Okay, hold on one second. I want to focus the conversation. Uh-huh. I want to talk to Shelby. Okay. So, Me? why doesn't it happen in Shelby? Because, like, I do wish that I could go out and, you know, be like, okay, I want to be that person that totally pushes the envelope and all that stuff. But then it just, like, doesn't happen because... All of a sudden, everyone, including myself, is worried what everyone else is going to think. Mm -hmm. so, so it doesn't happen for you because other voices are telling you, nah, no. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, I understand that. Um, well, you have to decide, I think, who you want to live your life for. Mm -hmm. Do you want to live your life for Shelby or do you want to live your life for them? Do you want to make their mistakes? Do you want to make your mistakes? Do you want to become who you are or do you want to become who they want you to be? Well, that's definitely it. I want to be who I am. But like I said, like society is so such conformed to something in particular that I think it's hard for everyone to grow up. Yeah. To be Can who I they tell you the most be. important virtue I believe that we have? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what Maya Angelou said to Dave Chappelle when they did an interview with each other on a show called Iconoclast, which means to break down the icon. And she said. Um, she said, courage is the most important virtue you can have because it allows all other virtues to come into play. Now, you may say love's the most important virtue, but if you don't have the courage to love, love can't come into play. Mm -hmm. Courage, again, means it's from two words, cour, age, or uh, excuse me, the cour, heart, and age of the heart, courage. So what you need is courage. Mm -hmm. It's the courage to be who you are. And, and there's, again, another, Emerson's one of my favorite authors, and he said, God will not make himself manifest to cowards. So if you are going to live for them, God or the light that's in you, just call it the light that's in you, is not going to show up. Mm -hmm. For you to be you, you have to be able to walk and say, guys, you may reject me. You may reject me. I had to walk with this film in front of my money people, the people that I've made $2 billion for, and say, guys, you may reject this. But this is actually what I believe. It took death, facing death, for me to have the courage to do this movie. So I do not in any way say that I'm more courageous than you. I had mm -hmm. to stare at my own mortality and say, that's giving me the courage. I'm not dying with this inside me. But right now, there's something that may be dying inside you. Mm -hmm. 
And I ask you to look at that. Folks, have the courage. We've got to stop creating this culture of drones and we get in packs. Be yourself in love and kindness. Have the courage. That is the whole spiritual journey. You stand on your own two feet. You say, this is where I'm standing. Perfectly, imperfectly, this is who I am. What do you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and then also I feel like um, you were just saying that you think deep down inside everyone is, isn't greedy. We're not greedy people. So why do we, you know, like worship the movie stars that are rich and famous? And like, why is that? Like, why don't we worship the people like, you know, you say Gandhi and stuff. And like, personally, yeah, definitely those type of people. Because people who have money, that's not, that doesn't mean much. But so why does society like just think like, oh my gosh, they're amazing. I'll like, tell you a couple reasons why I believe it happens. Um, and, and I'm not kidding when I say this. I believe that we're mentally, <laughs> mentally ill. I do. I believe we're mentally ill. I believe we're mentally ill. So, okay, let's define a mental illness. It is a break from reality when you're not behaving uh, according to what the real world is. If the real world is, is as Gandhi said, love is a force. If the real world is that we're all connected, guess what? You're going to walk outside. There's going to be a homeless person. You're connected to that person. They're well-being is actually in your own interest because you could be mugged, raped, or robbed because they're hungry, they're desperate, they're in a sickness that they may have. So if the real world is we're connected, we're behaving as if we're not. We're mentally ill. I believe I was mentally ill, and I hope I'm coming out of that mental illness because I bought into a culture that taught me that when you, when you make it, take as much as you can. So I argued for as much money on every movie I could get, and I took that money. Now I gave some of it away, but I believe that philosophy of taking is a cancerous philosophy. So we're mentally ill. Now why are we mentally ill? Why? Because that would mean maybe we aren't that as smart as we think or as good as we think. The human species, folks, is 165,000 years old, plus or minus. That's really insanely young. Now I'm going to give you, please stay with me on this, it'll, it'll be done in two minutes. But this is the history of life on Earth, and we are a part of that history. So life on Earth, four billion years or so old, began as single cell life. Those single cells started acting just as we're acting now. They were very feisty and very competitive. And at some point, they began, quote unquote, talking to each other. This was told me, to me in this film by an evolutionary biologist named Elizabeth Satoris. Elizabeth said those cells started talking to each other, and they realized, why are we competing? We're killing each other off. We're dying. We need to cooperate. And they started cooperating. Those cells then created a cooperative which became nucleated cells. They had creation come out of that. Nucleated cells, the same process. Fight, feisty, competitive, wait, let's cooperate. They create multi-celled creatures, us. We walk out of the oceans, we become us, and now we're in that same experimental stage. We're not doing this because we don't think it'll work. We think it's gonna work, but we're finding, wait, it's not working. People are dying. We know that's wrong. Wars keep breaking out. Why do they keep breaking? And we're now rethinking. I think we are at that point in the history of our civilization, of mankind itself and womankind, where we're rethinking. And I, it makes sense to you. I would bet if you and I just talked alone, you would say, that makes sense. It does. It makes sense. We, that's why we elevate Gandhi and you want to say, I want to be that because you know there's a power there that's not in, say, the, just a wealthy person who, uh -huh. oh, their movie did well. Okay, uh, uh, thank you for that walk down evolutionary road. Shelby, that's great questions. This conversation is not done. Let's keep it alive. I love you. I appreciate your openness to hearing this. And, and, and rock on. This is a great festival. So what do you think, audience? Let's give this man some real heart, real art and soul. Come on.